And here we are, my friends. We have arrived this Friday. AEW launches its second show known as Rampage. I don't know about you, but I think that's a big deal. Like two years ago, we didn't even have a real competition for WWE. And then AEW came along. Kapow! There was Dynamite. And now we've got Rampage. And I like these aggressive titles. It makes me want to fight. And for those that have been asking, yes, of course, we will be upping those downs for that show. Which just means Saturday, you're going to get a lot of me, Simon Miller. Because we'll do Smack It Down. Then we'll do Rampage. Then I'll take my bald head and I shall rest it on a pillow and I shall sleep because finally wrestling will have stopped. But before we do get there, what happened to AEW Dynamite last night? Was it any good? Or should I take my ass and rub it in somebody's face like I'm Rikishi? That's a weird thing to say. Let's up those doubts. Before we do get into the show properly, once again, you lovely, lovely people have made my absolute day because I spied two Simon give me an up signs on AEW Dynamite and I'm an easy person to please. I take the finger of power, I give it up and I stare down this camera lens and I tell you for real, I love you. We then cut straight to MJF after this who was committing the biggest of all promo sins because you are talking to anybody and you have a microphone near, you do not eat because the slapping of gums, well, it is like nails on a chalkboard. He was chewing on an apple though and saying to Chris Jericho that there's no way he's going to survive the fourth labor which is against Wardlow who was standing behind him and even if somehow he finds a way it doesn't matter because Maxwell is number five and he's gonna kill him. Wardlow then piped in that we don't have to worry about that because he will finish off Chris and then do you know what Maxwell did? He turned to him and he quipped oh yeah much like you beat Cody Rhodes in that cage. I was like man we are planting the seeds when Wardlow does become a good guy he's gonna break MJF in two and it's gonna rock. Wardlow then crushed this apple that MJF had been eating because you know he's a real big bad tough guy and I don't understand all this craziness that's been going on out there in internet land. People going, I can't believe Wardlow Wardlow's the fourth labor. It's brilliant that Wardlow is the fourth labor because think of everything else Chris Jericho has had to get through and we've said that Wardlow is even more intimidating than all of that. So once again, just building new stars with my hammer. We zoom right into our first match after this and I will keep it nice and simple. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks taking on the Seidel's and Dante Martin. And my word, just utter, utter craziness. Now everybody was awesome here, but as we do have a young up-and-comer in Dante Martin, I can only presume that in the back we went, right, we're going to shine a massive spotlight on you, so make sure you grab the ball and run with it. And not only did he run with it, he took a baseball bat and kapow, he smashed it out the park. If you go to your window and look outside, you'll probably just see Dante Martin flying by because he could not have done better. We really did build to him getting in the thing and when we pulled the trigger, my word, he was doing crazy dives to the outside. He was doing crazy dives in the ring where he got a near two on Matt Jackson. And even though Matt Seidel kind of got a lukewarm hot tag, it was Dante Martin that got the burning hot one and once again, he just went wild. Because he smashed Omega with a Hurricane Rana, hit a springboard moonsault onto Matt Jackson. And at this point, the tag team klaxon did sound oh, which means everybody was allowed to get in the ring I'm laughing at that sound effect what the hell was that like some kind of buffalo that was drowning but the point is everyone got in the squared circle and it was just move 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 even through all that Martin was able to get out of the one winged angel and then he started just spamming the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment but my word that I want him to get one and win but sadly this didn't happen he did get hit by the one winged angel he did get hit by the BTE trigger and he got pinned but I'm not going to say he lost, because my goodness, he did not. He came out the other side smelling of excellence. We certainly weren't done, though, because there was some fallout here in the guise of Christian Cage, who did let us know that at the All Out pay-per-view, it is going to be Kenny Omega, our world champion, taking on Christian, because he has worked his way to the top of the rankings. And of course, Hangman Adam Page dropped the ball. Now, some people seem annoyed about this because of the cowboy, but that's the whole point. He is our hero. We're desperate to see him do well, but he didn't. It's meant to hurt in your tum-tum. It's called emotion. I also think this match is going to be far better than people are expecting. Let's face it, AEW has a monster card planned for that pay-per-view. And also, wonderfully, Cage wasn't a dumb idiot here. He's a smart babyface because he got in the ring. And because he was staring down the elite, he too was backed up by the Jurassic Express. 
Go dinosaurs. Fans just lost it here with CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, yes chance, and I wonder why we were doing that. And there was another twist in the tale because come Rampage, which again debuts this Friday, we are going to do Kenny Omega versus Christian Cage round one, but here it's going to be for the Impact World title, and I audibly went, huh. Now usually I would raise an eyebrow to this because why would you do your big pay-per-view match before the pay-per-view, but as far as I'm concerned, it's nice and simple. If Christian becomes the Impact World Champion, not only is that going to make us go, well, maybe he beats Kenny Omega again and becomes the AEW title holder, and that's exactly what you want to do heading into a big show like All Out. Also, Christian being the Impact World Champion would be great, because it means he goes back to Impact. It gives me another reason to tune in. So basically, all of this came together to send my intrigue gland through the roof, and that doesn't make any sense. And then Jungle Boy carried that on when he said, oh, by the way, next week, Young Bucks, it's going to be you two taking on me and Luchasaurus. So this was just a manic start to Dynamite. But my word, it was pretty damn good. Also, quick shout out to Kenny Omega as well, who did a Simpsons boo joke. Man. This guy, five stars. We then just had the most nuts backstage skit with Malachi Black. And he was talking about Cody Rhodes and the retirement and the fact that he's half dead and his one boot. Remember what I said about that intrigue gland? It was just stuck in the on position here. And I cannot wait to see what the hell is next for this crazy cat. Speaking of such things too, Miro was then here doing the same kind of thing and there's no argument now. This is the version of Miro we've all been waiting for. He told us that his next TNT title defense <laughs> is gonna be against Fiego Del Sol. And this was hilarious, because as it turns out, if Fiego does win, he's gonna get an AEW contract. But of course, if he loses, Miro probably going to end his life. Based on his expressions and language, he probably is going to do that. And given these segments were back to back, well, it's nice and simple up. Fun was then reigning supreme. Because it was Danny Garcia taking on Darby Allen with 2.0 and Sting out there as well. Because the bad guys had decided, well, seven days ago, we feel like we got screwed over. So now we want to prove we're worth our soul. So all these three come across like absolute idiots and it makes me love them even more. And in the early going, Garcia and Allen were kind of at a stalemate here. <laughs> 2.0 just cast distraction because they know how to win wrestling matches. They kept doing this every time Darby Allen even threatened to make a comeback too and the way Danny Garcia dealt with this he was like a wrestling professor Layton. A puzzle was presented to him and he was able to figure it out. He did let himself down when he started chopping Darby because Allen was like you can't do that to me so he slapped him right back but even when he went for the coffin drop Danny caught him and applied a choke. Unfortunately, this didn't work. He then got hit by the stunner. He then got hit with a proper cover drop. One, two, three, Darby Allen wins. Afterwards, Matt Lee and Jeff Parker attacked instantly, but I was like, oh, you've gone and done it now. You've made a big mistake, because of course Sting was out here as well, and it was just one big rut roll. He ruined these guys, and if you can believe it, next week on TNT, on AEW Dynamite, Sting is going to team with his son to take on these two. I needed all of this in my life, and I didn't even know it. Up. The Death Triangle were here next, and I'll keep it nice and simple. I really like these guys. I think their shaped group is really good. But over the last few weeks, I just haven't been able to get my head around this whole thing when it comes to Andrade. So of course, Pac was super mad here due to all the recent shenanigans, and Phoenix was like, yeah, yeah, you get him, Pac. But Penta was enraged as well. So Pac turned to both of these guys and said, no, look, I'll deal with Andrade. You guys go after the tag team titles, and there was enough hints to make me presume that at All Out, we are indeed going to do Pac versus Andrade. Now that is going to be awesome. That is two of the best wrestlers ever. But when it comes to the build, I think this is based on the fact that Andrade and Ul Chavo have basically been cancelling their travel and saying to Penta and Phoenix, hey, you should be my friends. Don't be his buddy pal anymore. So I don't know. It just all kind of seems a little bit weird. So once more, when we do take it all together... Well, we got to give it a down. AEW was then back to fun. And never forget that those three letters are the most important thing in all of wrestling. That's why you tune in. Because it was Matt Hardy and Private Party teaming up with Orange Cassidy, Chuck Taylor and Wheeler Utah. And while it is a little bit strange that Christian seems to be done with House Hardy, 
I suppose he does have bigger fish to fry, namely the AEW world title. Cassidy and Hardy went toe to toe at the start of this, so it was just gimmick central. Because you had Cassidy doing all of his shtick, which is like, man, I can't be bothered. And you had Matt Hardy going, oh man, delete, delete, delete. And it's like, no one's ever watched wrestling before and they see this, they are going to be absolutely confused. It also reminded me why wrestling is great because it simultaneously makes all the sense and no sense, which is how I see my life. And then once again, somebody hit the shenanigans button. Because Nyla Rose just came came running out here and beat up Chris Statlander because they're going to have a match later. And because there was so much hoo-ha, Jack Evans was then here and he was just beating everybody up courtesy of Matt. I think everybody was hitting maneuver towards the end of this, but as it turned out, no move was better than Matt Hardy's move because Wheeler Yuta walked into the twist of fate and that was it, one, two, three. And yes, I know, there was a lot of run-ins in this, but it was kind of just there and it was kind of just entertaining. It didn't bug me. So what are you going to do? I'm also kind of excited because I think now surely this could lead to Matt Hardy versus Wheeler Utah. And once again, that's a match I didn't know I needed, but I do. Andrade and Uchavo were then here and they basically established that yes, we are going to do this match at the pay-per-view. So they'll do the match at the pay-per-view. Had a cool video afterwards with Santana Ortiz and they were like, man, we're going to flub you up so bad, FTR, when you do come back to the show. And they also showed footage of Cash Wheeler's injury here. And I just hope that he's okay, because it looks horrible. And then Chris Statlander got her revenge on Nyla Rose after Nyla Rose had been an idiot. Good up. Nyla Rose was using her power to begin with, because of course she is powerful, whereas Chris Statlander is an alien, so she was using alien quick moves. And then I think we had the weirdest distraction of 2021, because Orange Cassidy was back out to support Chris. And at one point, he got into it with Vicky Guerrero, who, and I kid you not, got right in his face and just went, ah, and screamed at him. I was like, man, I don't know what's going on anymore. I feel a little bit uncomfortable. It was so blood curdling, Statlander was taken aback and she got chokeslammed on the apron. And then when Nyla Rose set her up in that hands down position against the ropes to hit that knee off the top, Chris Statlander started doing this cool handstand walk. So Nyla looked at her and went, nah, bruh, you are doing that and speared the hell out of her. That was really good. But yeah, look, this was Chris Statlander's night and the commentary team were hinting, oh, maybe she takes on Britt Baker soon. So she hit this really good power bomb from the corner, finished it off with a 450 splash and she beat Nyla Rose. And once again, the announced team was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. How the hell did she do that? This was so simple, but as the cliche goes, very effective. And then the Young Bucks man. I know I'm sending a lot of love out on this week's episode of Ups and Downs, but I'm sending more love out to them because they are just the ultimate goofs. Because they were talking to Brandon Cutler about how easy it was going to beat Jurassic Express next week, almost as easy as a layup in basketball. So they then went to do a layup and the Jurassic Express appeared, stole the ball, dunked it, and then just went, oh well, it's gonna be easy, is it? You absolute morons. This really tickled me. Please give me more of this. Had a good promo video between Red Velvet and Britt Baker too. Essentially Red Velvet was like, nobody knew who I was, but I made my name, so I'm gonna beat Britt Baker. And Britt Baker's like, no, you're not. I will still be champion when we fight on Rampage. And then out came Britt Baker to do a promo in front of the crowd she was in her hometown this was just damn good up. and it really was down to the reaction but also dmd was so smart here because while she was still acting like an arrogant so-and-so she also knew how to tie that into the fact she was in front of people that were supporting her i thought this was really well done especially when she went well i can't really relate to red velvet struggle from being nobody because i have always been a star we then promised that she would retain her belt at rampage when red velvet ran out and punched her right in the face and i was like good that's the way to do it and of course she did get booed and look when we get to friday night Britt baker should win because it's not time to change the title but i do think red velvet is benefiting from all of this greatly had a face-off video between ricky starks and brian cage next and next week they're going face to face and then Scott Damore joined the commentary team because we were about to do the Dark Order taking on the Good Brothers for the Impact Tag Team Championships. It was a really interesting part as well, given that it was only Colt Cabana that came out with his Dark Order brethren, because of course they're all at odds with each other, given what had gone down with Hangman Adam Page. And as I've always said, in any kind of good story, you need a bit of tragedy, because then when all of a sudden you get the redemption, it just feels all the more sweet. The best thing about all of this, though, is that I was desperate for Evil Uno and Stu Grayson to become the new champions. So when they didn't, once again, I was upset. So just look at all the strands that we're creating here. You have a bunch of guys that you're willing to do well, but as of right now, 
They simply can't. This was also another match filled with madness, so thank goodness for Frankie Kazarian. Because Brandon Cutler was just pulling Evil Uno off the apron at one point, and even though Colt Cabana kind of scared him off, somebody needs to get rid of him, and who better than the Elite Hunter? He picked him up, and he chucked him away. It meant that back in the ring, the Dark Order were able to go for the fatalities. Oh my gosh, please hit it, but they didn't. But then the Good Brothers were going for the magic kit. I was like, oh no, please don't hit it, but they didn't. So the Evil Uno and Drew Grayson were then going for the fatality again. But once again, they weren't able to hit it because of distraction. Because Gallows just got one of the tag team belts and he threw it in the ring. And this caused such a flutter, especially when it came to the referee. Carl Anderson was able to hit the stun gun. Gallows and Anderson then did hit a magic killer and they were able to get the one, two, three. Now, before I get into this, the match was very good and I enjoyed it muchly, especially the whole, oh my gosh, who's going to win? So I'm going to give it an up. But when it came to that finish, Man, I just didn't get it. And I totally get what we were doing here. We're trying to put more heat onto the Good Brothers. But why on earth would a referee, a proper official and employee of a wrestling company, see a belt get chucked into the ring, which wasn't being used as a weapon, and go, I'm going to focus more on that and completely ignore what's happening behind me? Look, I'm always happy for companies to try new things and I never want it to stop. But this one personally for me was a miss and it's getting it down. Quick promo from Camille about her upcoming NWA women's title match against Layla Hirsch. And I thought Camille came across really well here. Like, man, I don't give a cup about this person. I'm going to whoop her ass. And then the big show or Paul White, whatever the hell we want to call him, made his first proper appearance on Dynamite. And it was really well done. Because we finally got to QT Marshall's apology towards Tony Schiavone, but surprise, surprise, he didn't want to say sorry to Tone, he wanted Tone to say sorry to him. And Schiavone's like, I want to put up with this BS, I've got better things to do. So the Nightmare Factory went into the crowd, they got Tony Schiavone's son, and they started to beat him up. And they said, well, you better say sorry now, and because Tony Schiavone's the greatest person on this planet, he said, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please don't hurt him. So what did they do? Here with a flipping diamond car. And it was here, of course, when Paul White did come storming to the ring to help his broadcast partner. And I laughed a little bit because in his music, he still has a soundbite that goes, Whirl! and that's just going to make me chuckle to the end of time. And my word, the Nightmare Factory turn on Aaron Solo here. They pushed him into Paul White. He gave him the choke slam. And I was like, are we going to do QT Marshall versus Paul White? Because once again, here's that phrase again. I didn't know I needed it. By Jove. I want it. Also, because we haven't seen Paul in this capacity that much, you forget how big he is. That dude truly is massive. This is me looking at the height of Paul White. So I thought that was a really well put together angle, as was the main event. The fourth labor of Jericho, Chris Jericho taking on Wardlow with MJF at ringside. I just thought all of this was put together wonderfully and I'm giving it up. And as ever, people are going, man, this is so boring. I can't believe Jericho made it all the way through. Is that what happens when you watch a Marvel movie and the hero wins? Of course not. Sometimes you have to do the obvious and it's more about the journey, especially in this match because Wardler had decided, well, I quite like the power bomb. Power bomb's quite a devastating move. Why don't I give you 79 of these and then see what your ass can do? And that's basically what he did and he came across like an absolute monster, especially because in the first minute or so, Jericho hit the code breaker, a move that he's won world titles with, and Wardlow kicked out a one. She's like, my word, this man is a beast. Wardlow definitely had this whole thing won, but Max on the outside turned into all Mortal Kombat guy and was going, finish him, finish him. So he did go through that crazy knee thing off the top, but when he did, he failed, and Jericho was able to reverse it into the walls of Jericho. But then that damn MGF just walked up, boop, and he poked him right in the eye. All of this bit him in the ass, though, because he was about to interfere again when the referee caught him and said, sorry, Max, you've got to go to the back. And because she wasn't watching, Jericho got Floyd the baseball bat. He clonked Wardlow right in the head, that meant he did pin him. So once again, it's another terrific use of not only making sure Wardlow doesn't look like a dum-dum, but Jericho can finally get to Maxwell Jacob Friedman. And I wanted this, I want to see that match. A huge smash happened afterwards as Sean Spears was here and Sammy Guevara here was to get rid of him and Jake Hagar too. When Maxwell let us know what the stipulations for their fifth labor was going to be, Chris Jericho isn't allowed to use the Judas effect and also he's not even allowed to enter to his Judas music. And he knew what he was doing. He was like, ha, 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 ha. the fans aren't going to be able to sing it, which of course means they're going to sing it anyway. And hey, look, I do admit if I was in MJF's shoes and I was choosing the stipulations, I'd be like, look, you can't pin me. You can't submit me. Also, I get to use a gun, but maybe that's going too far in the opposite direction. But genuinely, while I assume that Chris Jericho will win, I'm not 100% sure 
And that seed of doubt is really important. Maxwell also had a great line where he said that not only is Chris Jericho going to meet his match, but he's going to meet his successor. And once again, I thought this was a very good episode of AEW Dynamite, and I'm giving it up. Now, please do go in the comments below and let us know what you thought about last night's AEW Dynamite, and are you looking forward to Rampage? I mean, it's essentially three title matches, which is pretty damn good. Then like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where you can stay up to date with all the wrestling news. Come say hello on social media, and go and watch every single ups and downs video ever because why the hell not? My name is Sarah for What Culture. Thank you for watching me as always. And look, I'll see you before then. But on Saturday, I'll see you twice. You're going to be sick of me. What are you going to do? Goodbye.